Good evening, good morning, good afternoon. Welcome to Walking Through the Book of Matthew. Oh my goodness, I am so excited about this journey. Now in the past, we've looked at Exodus, we've looked at Genesis, uh, I believe we've looked at Acts, but today we're going to start walking through the book of Matthew. And there's so much to study, there's so much to look at, and so we're going to take our time and walk into it with a pretty large introduction. We're going to see that there's so many things that will help us to understand the importance and the value of this book. So get your paper, get your pencil, get pens, get whatever you need to do. Get 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 ready, strap up, strap up, so we can walk through the book of Matthew. Now we're going to um, we're going to start with a lot of of uh, introductory vocabulary. There are some things that we need to make sure that we understand. First of all, let me suggest that between the book of Matthew and Malachi, Malachi being the last book of the Old Testament, Matthew being the first book of the New Testament, there are 400 years. There are 400 years where there is no voice from God. And what we want to do is we want to understand what is happening during that 400 year period. What, what, what's going on? And so one of the things that I would like to point out to you is that there are some words that come up in the New Testament, some institutions that come up in the New Testament that we never saw in the Old Testament. And these were some of the things that happened during that 400-year period. That 400-year period is called the intertestamental period. In the intertestamental period, intertestamental period there was no voice from God coming through the prophets the last prophet of the Old Testament Malachi prophesies and he's basically telling the children to take things seriously take your worship seriously take your your marriages seriously take take your time with God seriously take the the rituals of the sacrifice seriously because they they were as some would say that we do now they were playing church and Malachi is telling them this, this is a serious thing. And after Malachi, there is no prophecy. There is no word coming from God for 400 years. And in that 400 year period, some things spring up that we didn't, that we will see in the New Testament that we didn't see in the Old Testament. In the New Testament, we did, we see the word synagogue. We didn't see that in the Old Testament. The focus of the Old Testament was first the tabernacle and then we had the temple, but we didn't see the word synagogue. A synagogue is a building where a Jewish assembly or congregation meets for religious worship and instruction. Instruction was the a main um, foundational purpose of the synagogue, right? And we didn't see the words Pharisees and Sadducees in the, in the Old Testament, but we see them in the New Testament, A Pharisee then becomes someone who has strict observance of the traditional and written law. Sadducees, however, were different. They they deny the resurrection of the dead, the existence of spirits, and the obligation of oral tradition. The only thing they focused on was the written law, or what they would say is the law of Moses. Uh, And so in in the Old Testament, coming out of of the Old Testament, we we see some things happening that would forever change Israel. We see a civil war, and and in essence, now Israel is split in two. The northern kingdom, which is called Israel, and the southern kingdom, which is called Judah. We see the Babylonians, we see the Persians, and by the time of Christ, we see the Romans taking control uh, of, of of the nations of Israel. And so their language, their culture, their religion, their traditions, their temple, all gone, all all destroyed. Now, and so between Malachi and Matthew, there's a lot of things happening. But one thing that is not happening is there is no voice from God. When we finally get to Matthew, we'll see that Matthew is different. 
Um, let me give you another term, the synaptic gospels. The, the word synaptic means similar, means same. And so between Matthew, Mark, and Luke, we see what we would call the synoptic gospels. They're the, they're the same, they're similar. They're, they have the, many of the same uh, parables, many of the same stories, many, many of the same miracles, right? They're called the synoptic gospels. John is also a gospel, but it's not a synoptic gospel. John uh, is a gospel that's a little bit different. Um, John writes about relationship. Uh, John writes about love. John, John writes, John is the only gospel where you see, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever should believe it on him should not perish but have everlasting life. So John looks at the humanity and the love that Jesus had. Um, Mark, uh, also called John Mark, uh, he wasn't an apostle and he wasn't an eyewitness. He seems to have been a protege of Peter. But Mark focuses on the life and the teachings of Jesus. Mark portrays him as a teacher slash servant. Mark's explanations of Jewish customs and, and his translations of Aramaic expressions suggest that he was writing for Gentile converts. Mark ca characterizes Jesus as reluctant to reveal himself as the Messiah. Jesus refers to himself only as the Son of Man. And then we have Luke. Luke emphasizes the humanity of Jesus. Luke focuses on the work, passion, crucifixion, and resurrection of Jesus as the fulfillment of Jewish scripture. Luke was a physician. Luke was a, company, a, a companion of Paul. And Luke was not Jewish. He was a Gentile. But then we come to Matthew. Matthew, uh, in his person, was a tax collector. And you know, tax collectors, much like today, but were hated by the people. They weren't popular. And Matthew gives up everything to follow this man, Christ. And he paints Jesus as a teacher. And so in the book of Matthew, there are five discourses where Jesus is teaching. Matthew is written in a logical, not a chronological fashion. And in Matthew, there are more Old Testament quotations than all of the other Gospels combined. Matthew's purpose is to show Jesus is the promised Messiah. He is, in fact, the one that we, we were promised way back in Genesis. And so we have the synoptic Gospels of Matthew, Mark, and Luke. But then we have John by itself. <clears throat> now the story then... Before we get to Matthew, I, I want us to fully appreciate what Matthew is. Matthew gives us a promise, the, the fulfillment of a promise that goes all the way back to the book of Genesis. And so if you will allow me the time, let's, let's go back to Genesis. Um, and you will remember with me that in Genesis... God creates man. And one of the things I found out about God, one of the things that I'm discovering, God never has interactions with humanity without telling his creation, this is what I want you to do. Because we find in the first chapter of Genesis, uh, we'll go all the way back down to verse 26. Then God said, let us make man in our image. In our likeness and let them rule over the fish of the sea and the birds of the air over the livestock over all the earth and over all the creatures that move along the ground so God created man in his own image in the image of God created he him God blessed them and God said to them be fruitful and multiply and in increase uh, subdue the earth a rule over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the air and over every living creature. And then, so God's telling them what to do and God goes on to tell them that this is what you can do in the garden. You got this beautiful garden and I want you to take care of it. You are free to eat from any tree in the garden, but you must not eat from the tree of, the, of knowledge of good and evil for when you eat of it, you will surely die. 
So God makes mankind, makes he, he makes man first, then he makes woman, and, and he gives them instructions, and he tells them what to do, tells them what not to do. And what do they do? They do what he told them not to do. They do what he told them not to do. And so now there's a separation. And that's what sin does. Sin is basically any time we disobey God. And sin causes separation. But because God loves mankind, he has a plan. I'm going to bring him back to me. And the reason why mankind failed is because of this this spirit, this creature, this, this Satan that always wants to destroy God's creation. And my brother, my sister, even in the 21st century, God wants to destroy, Satan wants to destroy God's creation. He wants to destroy, not because he cares about you. His fight is with God. But we go to Genesis 3.15, and in Genesis 3.15, we find a promise that I know Satan tricked you. I know Satan got you kicked out of the garden. I know Satan destroyed the relationship that we had. I, I, I know Satan has caused you to now be headed towards death. But I've got a promise for you. What's the promise, God? Well, God talks to the serpent and he says to the serpent. Uh, so the Lord said to the serpent, because you have done this, cursed are you above all the livestock and all the wild animals. You will crawl on your belly and you will eat the dust all the days of your life. And I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and hers. He will crush your head and you will strike his heel. I'm going to destroy you through the seed of a woman. And it says he, so we know it's going to be a man child. This woman is going to give birth to a man child, to a boy that will crush your head. Fatal blow. You'll strike at his heel, but he's going to he's going to destroy you. And so when we go over to the fourth chapter of Genesis, Adam lay with his wife Eve and she became pregnant and gave birth to Cain. She said, with the help of the Lord, I have brought forth a man. Now you got now be, walk with me through the thoughts that Eve must have had. This must be the child. He told me that my seed, a man was going to be born out of me, and and he would crush the serpent. Certain, Satan did me dirty. He did me wrong. Got me kicked out of the garden. Messed up my relationship with with God. And, and because of that, now I'm having child bear bearing that's pain. I, I, oh, is this the one? But not only did she have thoughts, Satan also had to have thoughts. Is this the child that's going to destroy me? Is this the child that's going to crush my head? I got to do I got to destroy this child. So Adam lay with his wife Eve, and she became pregnant and gave birth to Cain. She said, With the help of the Lord, I have brought forth a man. Later she gave birth to his brother, Abel. And we go on to find out that Satan gets with Cain. And let's go down to the 8th cha- verse of verse 4. Now Cain said to his brother Abel, Let's go out to the field. And while they were in the field, Cain attacked his brother Abel and killed him. And Satan's got to think, I've got him now. I- I've killed the one that was going to, to crush my head. And for the first time, we have the shedding of human blood. For the first time, we have murder. And Satan is happy. Let's go to Genesis 6. But God still got a plan. Genesis 6, 1 through 3. Satan is still trying to destroy mankind. trying to destroy God's creation. When men began, began to increase in number on the earth and daughters were born to them, the sons of God saw that the daughters of men were beautiful and they, and they married any of them they chose. Then the Lord said, My spirit will not contend with man forever, for he is mortal. 
his days will be a hundred and twenty. And and Satan kept talking to the to mankind, kept whispering in the ear, kept tempting them with the lust of the flesh, the the lust of the eye, and the pride of life. That's those are the only three weapons that Satan has: the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eye, and the pride of life. And so God says, "I'm going to wipe out." Created what I've created. I'm going to destroy. And Satan's happy. I've got him. My head won't be crushed. Because he's going to wipe them out. But Noah. Praise God. But Noah found favor in the eyes of the Lord. You see Noah was a righteous man. Blameless among the people of his time. And he walked with God. And so we see Noah. Noah being the salvation of mankind because God wipes out the entirety of the earth except for Noah, his family, his three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. And so there's still a hope. And so now we move to Genesis, the 12th chapter, and here it is. It's important that we understand all of this before we get to the book of Matthew. In Genesis, the 12th chapter, Coming out of the line of of Noah, uh, the Lord, there's a man named Abram. A man named Abram. And the Lord said to Abram, Leave your country, your people, and your father's household, and go to the land I will show you. I will make you a great nation, and I will bless you, and I will make your name great, and you will be a blessing. I will bless those that bless you, and whoever curses you, I will curse. All the peoples of the earth will be blessed through, not by you, through you, through your seed. And so that means not only the Jewish nation, but the Gentiles. The the whole the whole world will be blessed through you, and so when we get to Matthew and we look at the genealogy of Christ, a strange thing happens. Not only do we have Gentiles, but we have women. You don't see women in the genealogy of the Old Testament. You don't see Gentiles in the genealogy of the Jews of the Old Testament. But the promise, the promise. He, the seed of a woman. And so Abram has two sons. And we won't have time to go into why there's, his two sons are still fighting. One son becomes the father of the, the Muslim Arabic nations. The other son becomes the father of the Jewish nation. And so we go from Abraham to Isaac. And we go from Isaac to Jacob. And Jacob has 12 sons one of which is called Judah. And the messianic line will run through Judah. And then finally we get down to this this king of Israel. And this king of Israel is named David. And you will notice in the old in the New Testament, sometimes Christ is called the son of David. Because the prophecy says he would come through the line of David. Let's go to Jeremiah thirty-three seventeen. Um, Jeremiah uh, thirty-three seventeen. Let me find that really quickly. Bear with me just a second. Yeah, you probably thought, is he going to go through all the books of the Bible showing us? No, no, showing us the prophecy? No, 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 no. Jeremiah, we'll skip all the way to Jeremiah thirty-three seventeen. For this is what the Lord says: David will never fail to have a man sit on the throne of the house of Israel, nor will the priests who are the Levites ever fail to have a man stand before me continually to offer burnt offerings to burn grain offerings and to present sacrifices. But you see, there's a problem. And we'll get into this um, more next week, but there's a problem. David had sons, I believe about 11 sons, and one of his sons was evil, and God tells him, you will never have, none of your line will ever sit on the throne. And Satan again says, I got him. The, 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 
the prophecy is ended because I've gotten in this, this man's ear and, and he is so evil that he will never have a son. I got him. But he forgot that there were more than one son and one son's name was Nathan. And when we get to the we will look at the genealogy not only in Matthew, but we'll look at the genealogy in Luke. And we will find that the genealogy of Matthew shows us how Christ uh, came out of the lineage of Joseph. But Joseph wasn't his daddy. But Joseph did come out of the lineage of David. And we get to Luke and I'll just, we're not going to study Luke at the same time, but when we get to the genealogy in Luke, we'll see that Luke gives us the genealogy of Mary. And Mary traces back to David, but one of David's good sons named Nathan. And so both Mary and Joseph come from the lineage of David, but one comes from a son, Kaniah used to be Jeconiah, but J-E stands for Jehovah, so that was taken off. He could no longer be part of the lineage of the Christ. But but th- his line gives us a legal right for Christ to be called the Messiah. But Mary's line through Nathan gives us a spiritual right for him to be the Son of God. And so, when we get to Matthew, we will see that Matthew, and I can imagine through generations, through centuries, every Jewish mother, is he the one? Is he the one? And the significance of Matthew, he's finally here. And and we will see that that the, the leaders of the time tried to trap Jesus, tried to question Jesus ab- about many things, but they never questioned him about his lineage. They never questioned him about his genealogy because that was public record. And they could see that, well, we, he is in fact the son of David. And he would claim that I'm also the son of God. So I'm excited about our walk through Matthew Oh my goodness, we're going to learn some things together. We're going to see some things together. And most of all, we're going to see that God is faithful. If God promised a thing, he will bring it forth. If God said something's going to happen, it will happen. And so next week, please join me as we continue our walk through the book of Matthew. Listen, I love you. I really do. But God loves you more. Until next week, I'll see you. Bye-bye.